And we're joined on the phone today by author Paul Reese. We're talking about his new book, The Ox, the authorized biography of the Who's John Entwistle. Hey, Paul, how's it going today? I'm very good, thanks for staying with you, all right? Yeah, things are good here. It's great speaking with you today. Uh, likewise, thank you for doing this. It's really appreciated. Well, let's talk a bit about your new book, The Ox, the authorized biography of the Who's John Entwistle. Well, what are the listeners in store for here with the new book? Well, hopefully, it's, um, the, the reason for doing it was the, the sense that John's story had been largely untold. You know, that the people had the sense that he was just this stoic guy who stood stage right and didn't do a lot and didn't move around. And, and underneath the bonnet of that, so to speak, was this um, very complex, colourful character. So uh, the, the idea right along with it, it, it there's, a, there's a story that's never been told about John Emerson, that there was the four members of the Who. He was every bit as... Um, as wild as Keith Moon and as complex as Pete Townsend, and, and this is the, 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 quite a bit of the book is uh, taken from an autobiography that John started to write and never finished, and then his family, wives, ex-wives talk on the record as well. So it's 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 a hopefully a rounded picture of one of the more interesting and, and, and hitherto hidden characters in rock music. Awesome, yeah, and it's the authorized biography, so you've had some access to the family and a lot of insight that's probably never been heard before. Well, I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I, I did it in uh, Christopher, who's John's only son, um, was the, the guy who authorized it, and, and, and I worked really closely with him. He was great, Christopher. And, and right from the start, he said he wanted it to be an honest portrait of his father because he said, you know, he, he wanted it to be warts and all. And, it, and he said to me from day one, he wouldn't ask me to change anything other than things that he knew were factually not correct and that he'd been there and could say they weren't correct. And, and he was true to his word all the way through. Um, and he did give me um, the pages, all the, the stuff that John had completed for his autobiography, the, the notes and the typed up work. Uh, and he gave me suitcases full of stuff that his dad had kept because uh, his dad hoarded stuff. So there were, just from the Quadrophenia tour, there were all the tour diaries and itineraries and notes things like that. So it, 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 he did. He opened up a, a gold mine to me, which was, which made, I think, made the book all, it made it my job easier, much easier to do. Well, and of course, it, it would have been interesting to have read John's uh, book if he had finished it before he died, but being the kind of guy he was, maybe you uh, writing the biography, we might have gotten some more details that maybe he would have, you know, not shared in the book. Well, I, I think it was, it was really interesting because they, when I started talking to Chris, he thought that John had done um, complete three chapters, and that's all the worst. And, and he'd actually written four chapters, and then there were reams of notes that he'd made. Um, and he was a really good writer. He was he was a really engaging, funny, articulate writer. So I think if he had finished it, it would have been a really enjoyable, insightful book. But I think the nature of John as a character was he was he was quite butterfly minded. So. The, the idea that he would sit down in a room at a, at a, you know, as a typewriter and spend weeks and months bashing out the book was never, ever going to happen. I think he started, it got bored, and then there was always something else more enjoyable or funnier to do than, than sit and write his own story. So I don't think it was ever likely that he would have finished it. Um, and I, I don't think, that from what he, a lot was defeated, I don't, that level of self-analysis, he was much more, you know, he was, he was quite erudite and quite funny. Um, the, the, the thing that surprised me more than anything, I, I think that, that uh, how sad the story was. You know, that the last, I guess, the last quarter of his life is, is quite harrowing and quite dark, um, and, and and that's the bit that that, that was. I, I didn't expect that when I started out on it, and I think that that was the surprising thing. Well, again, Paul Reese with us, author of the book The Ox, the authorized biography of the Who's John and Whistle. You know, and Paul, as you mentioned, when it comes to the Who, it, it seems like John was maybe sort of lost in the shuffle a bit because, you know, the other guys in the band had such large personalities and, you know, Keith Moon, Pete Townsend, these are like guys that are, uh, you know, giants in, in that field. So, you know, he was kind of a bit lost, it seems. Yeah, and I think he was acutely aware of that and, and very frustrated by it in, in, in the sense of the songwriting. You know, he was the only member of the band other than Townsend who wrote songs regularly for the Who. Uh, and he felt it was difficult for him to be heard in that way. So his answer to that was to turn his bass up louder than anybody had ever done it before. Um, but also as a personality, definitely. Um, he was quite reserved-seeming, he, he but I think that there was a lot that went on 
with John that, that wasn't seen by people who would just be, you know, more passive observers or people who didn't know him that well. Um, but I, again, it surprised me the thing that was Keith Moon. Obviously, all everybody knows about the things that Keith Moon did, but John Infielder was his partner and cry all the way through that. And, and a lot of the things they got up to would be John Infielder would instigate them, and then he would manage to be out of the way when the trouble came, and, and he'd let Moon take the fall for it. But they were very much double act. And probably at the four band members, they were the two cl- who were closest together. The one who got the ones who got on best. Um, and I think losing Moon when Moon he lost Moon, that was, if anything, a tipping point to, to where John's life got spiraled out of control as well. Yeah, it is interesting um, the kind of different sides to John that you you touch on in the book. You had the ex- extravagant rock star side, but also kind of the uh, simple, you know, hang out at the bar guy as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think he was very. I think he's. Uh, uh, his first wife, Alison, put it best. Um, and you know, she said he was very much when he was at home. He, he was very much a home, but you know, he, he would he liked his fish and chips. He liked to pine to the pub. He liked sitting from the telly. He, he kept fish. Um, uh, he was he was about quote unquote as normal as he could be. But he he lived to be out on the road. I think he saw that as allowing other aspects of his personality to come. And, and he was certainly the band mem- the member of the Who that wanted to tour the most, that enjoyed touring the most. I think it, it allowed him to become this other personality, which he hadn't, you know, this was a guy who left school to go and work in a tax office. And the, the, the band was his escape from that, and it, it allowed him to become something else. I think and he ended up kind of falling into the trap of playing up to that the longer he went on. But he, he was, yeah, he was very much a, a split personality in that sense. Somebody was, was comfortable at home, but then when he was at home for any length of time, wanted to get away and, and live this sort of fantasy life as much as possible as well. Well, and obviously the influence he had on, you know, bass players and just music in general, probably way more than people think. I always found it fascinating um, in the equipment that he would use on stage. I mean, he had so many amps and, you know, caps and stacks. I can't imagine standing on stage every night uh, with that kind of volume that they had. Well, I think that that was an ongoing. I mean, it was an ongoing thing within the house. Certainly, Dorpsey was tortured by it, and and it probably accounted as much as anything for Tens and going deaf. You know, that that that, like you said, he had such an enormous, or he got to have such an enormous backline of equipment. They called it. I mean, the Who's roadies called it Little Manhattan because it just looked like the Manhattan skyline. It was this towering thing, and one all musicians you spoke to, right, whether it be Ringo Starr, I spoke to Randy Bachman, he played as John in um, the Ringo Starr All Star Band. Jo- uh, I spoke to um, Joe Walsh, and, and all of them said the same thing. That not that John was obviously a virtuoso, but it was just the sheer volume that he played at. But it, it was definite, and and he, as John's hearing went, he got louder and louder still. So I, I think it was one of the recurring sort of comic themes of John's life that. He spent pretty much all his time in the Who with Roger Dawkins telling him to turn it down, and then he would mime as if doing it and turn it up again. So he, he just got loud by degrees. Well, Paul, I wish we had some more time, but uh, again, it's great that uh, John's story is uh, finally out there. The Ox is available now, and it's it's been great speaking with you again. Thank you so much. Likewise, Justin. Thank you very much. And again, that was author Paul Reese, his new book, The Ox. The authorized biography of The Who's John Entwistle is available now.